Hi, and welcome to part two of Critically Thinking About Technology, our first module for FSOS 3105. So when we left off with um, part one, we were here to our technology truth number five, uh, which is that variation in our technology use can mean all sorts of divides, um, an access gap and a knowledge gap um, as examples. And, uh, and the, the table that I have here uh, is, demonstrates how there are differences by demographic groups and as we saw in our earlier slide um, about uh, access related to education and income and geography, um, things like that. And here we see what the differences based on demographics can mean in terms of people who are more digitally ready versus those who are more um, hesitant. I think if you look within your own families, you'll probably see differences in um, those who have less access to technology, less comfort with technology. Say if you went to a grandparent and asked them to use TikTok or um, uh, Instagram, that they may feel less comfortable because it's just something that they're not used to. So um, one of the major things that we see is that technology is a social justice issue. And so just because you or I may have access to laptops and to high speed internet, it certainly doesn't mean everybody does. And, um, um, and so uh, we need to, as a society, um, if we think about the advantages that we get from our access to information and to the capabilities that technology offers us in terms of um, speed of sharing information, immediate access to information, the ability to, um, to share, to collaborate, to archive, to create, uh, things like that, um, we need to ask why everybody doesn't have that same access similar to our going to a public library and having access to books. And so um, as individuals and as a society, we can advocate for there to be uh, digital equity in terms of technology use. Um, um, we also see some of these uh, differences over time. Again, I mentioned here earlier about differences in uh, social media. And we begin to also ask not just what those differences can mean in terms of um, possibly negative as, um, um, access and um, not having the ability to access information, but also the flip side of what having that access um, might mean. And one of the links that I have for you um, is on the impact of our technology use, say, on our political views. Earlier in, in part one, I was showing you about social networks and about how we can um, share information within our networks and then be exposed to other people who are like us or um, people who are less like us and possibly broaden our understanding or possibly reinforce our understanding of certain things. And one of the phenomena that we see over time is how our own um, uh, political views have become much more polarized um, in the US. And if I come over here to this website, this is again is the Pew Internet and American Life Project. They have been tracking people's um, political views. And um, so I'm, I'm going to um, just show you the animation of this because again, um, what I want you to do is to think about timing here. So what they're doing is to track between 1994 and 2017. We can imagine how even more polarized we've gotten since 2017. Um, but this will show you about uh, 20, 23 years of, of time and what has happened in that time. Um, in terms of people's access to technology, I would guess that for many of you, um, this is your own birth year is going to be represented in here. Um, and so, um, you know, if your experience is primarily with uh, the way things are now in terms of our political polarization, you can get an idea that it hasn't always been that way. So I'm going to animate this data. 1994, you see we're much closer together, 99. 2004, 2011, 2014, 2015, 2017. And again, what I would ask you to think about is what technologically 
um, um, has been our phenomenon of use and exposure and um, and what has that meant for our sharing information and possibly for the reinforcement um, and polarization of our beliefs. So I'll come back here to our, our slide set. Our technology truths six and seven. So that, um, just looking at the potential polarization, um, the potential access to information, the potential divisions between um, a knowledge gap and a digital access gap, um, brings us to six and seven, which is our pro and con. Our use exposes us to many benefits, and yet our use also exposes us to many threats. And I would say that a lot of the critical perspective about technology, um, and by this I mean negative aspects about technology, really leans on some of these pictures that you see here. And um, so on one hand, we benefit from our ability through, say, FaceTime to make connections across um, space and time, so between grandparents and grandchildren. On the other hand, when we are using it together as a, as a family, is it possibly a distraction and a disruption or as one of my colleagues has called it, uh, technoference. So um, thinking critically about technology means that we consider its benefits um, and its potential consequences. Sometimes they are within the same realm, meaning that the benefits or consequences are to us as an individual. Um, other times the benefit to one might mean a consequence to another. So for instance, I may enjoy video conferencing with my class, but the noise in the room may be disruptive to my partner. We also keep a critical eye on the responsibility and influence of our wider society and institutions who can control our technology use. So you may not like using video conferencing um, in your workplace, for instance, but really what choice do you have if this is what your employer has chosen to do? Yet I can counter that and say then if this is your employer's choice, isn't it also your employer's responsibility to enable your comfort and your access uh, to that format. So these couple slides are related to the debate that we had in class related to the use of video conferencing, but they're specific to our previous debate in this course where we were looking at the use of uh, laptops in the classroom. And, my, um, and you can come back and, and look at these more closely um, as you like. Um, but my primary um, thought here is for you to have in, in your mind a, a more ecological perspective um, about technology use, that our use is very personal and, and in terms of our you, right? Um, and so if you were to think about being in the classroom and using laptops, all the benefits or, or constraints that it may call on you as an individual, um, 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 on the other hand, there are also uses um, of laptops in the classroom that may have social impacts. Um, so others may prefer to not be distracted by your technology use, by your laptop use. Um, say if you have your laptop open and you're on Facebook while the class is going, that may be a distraction to somebody else. You may like having Facebook on, but it may be a distraction to your um, student neighbor. So whose responsibility is it to move? Um, and then at a wider society is the, is the, the university. And so um, the university has, is immersed in the use of technology for communication, for content delivery, learning management systems, uh, things like that. And, um, and so to be able to request or demand that we use uh, technology that extensively the, the university also holds responsibility to ensure that our use is safe and um, effective. Um, another consideration of it is from the standpoint of the individual benefits and consequences to you as an individual, as well as the benefits and consequences to um, the, the, your wider social world, as well as the larger society. So the idea is, is that our technology use, we can be influenced by ourselves, by our motivations. Um, we can be influenced um, in our social world. We can be influenced by um, choices made at a wider administrative level. Um, and 
uh, regardless of those influence, we can also um, experience benefits and consequences to our own individual selection, but also the use by other people in our social world and by these wider administrative institutional choices around whether or not we have access to particular devices. And so what I want you to be continuing to hold into your heads is that your use is individualized, pro and con. Um, there are many influences, preferences, abilities, um, accommodations that you hold as an individual. But your use of technology is largely social. You use it with other individuals for benefit, but also your use with individuals need to hold those individuals in consideration. And your use is also part of a larger society. And that larger society can dictate your use. It can also challenge your use. It can also support your use. Um, I have a number of uh, links for you. Let's see, we'll go back to um, our uh, internet over here. And um, in our course under uh, modules, and then we'll come to module one over here, you can see that I have optional materials. And for all of these different topics related to our use of technology, the benefits of technology, our critical thinking about it, I do have some additional links for you to consider. Um, the use of smartphones, social media. One of the consequences that you can consider, for instance, is um, trolling. So uh, you use, your use of social media is a pleasure because you can connect with others. On the other hand, what happens if you post something and someone doesn't agree with your political view? Um, you can be trolled and it can be just awful and, you know, um, and just destroy, you know, like your good feeling of using technology. And this particular podcast is with uh, Lindy West and it's her own experience as um, an online blogger and then being trolled by this person who was really pretty vicious. Um, it has an upside, <laughs> I give you that. Um, there's also the, the negative consequence of what do you do when you as an individual and you enjoy using Facebook, say, to connect with uh, your new freshman class. On the other hand, there's the danger of what you say on social media can be tracked and read by others um, and could potentially get you kicked out. And there's an, also an interesting story on, um, the, on a Hidden Brain episode that I have linked there about a young man who was admitted to Harvard and then whose offer to Harvard was rescinded um, based on uh, what he said on social media. There's also this idea about our use being programmed, and uh, we looked at, at um, that to a certain extent. And there are other um, links that I have here um, related to that programmed use. And, um, and one of the, um, one of the, the facets of the, um, of being programmed is, or of, um, other people having some control and influence on us is also the relationship to, um, privacy. And so that when we are, um, individually enjoying the use of Google or Facebook or TikTok or something like that at a much wider administrative or societal view is the idea of who's gathering information on us. And I have a video from uh, Adam Ruins Everything where he talks about using these free sites and also the cost for giving up our, our privacy. So um, just to let you know that the optional materials, we load it with lots of interesting uh, links and background. They're not required, um, but they do offer some um, an interesting take on many of the topics that we're covering. Okay, and then finally we'll return to our slide sets and finish up here. Okay. So again, you know, what I would recommend is um, that you just take a few moments on your own, consider your technology use. We're going to be doing this through the entire course, so this is certainly your only opportunity. Um, but consider how you use technology and where um, and the multiple aspects of it and your own um, individual use and what that means for um, you as an individual and the positives that it brings you and the possible negatives, particularly if you feel addicted to it. 
Um, also the possibility for your use, but what it means for you in a social setting. And then finally, or that social setting and how that impacts on your rights in individually or your comfort. And then finally, a wider institutional view of um, uh, encouragement to use technology, choices around technology, your government's uh, free access for you related to uh, the internet. There's a lot of discussion now about net neutrality. Um, and um, over time, you will start paying for it as our internet becomes more commercial. Um, and, um, and again, your individual role when you have these wider social influences. Um, and so as we, we close this out, we also need to think about the future. And we need to think about, again, a lot of these forces that for good and for maybe not so good are, are influences on us. Um, and so as we move into the future, what will this mean for um, our continued use of technology? So um, Charles Firestone, who is a communications and society program executive director at the Aspen Institute, a think tank, uh, said that the, the lure of convenience will continue to attract people. Those who disconnect will mostly be people who are actually personally affected. So we close down our use of social media when the trolling just gets too bad, but we start using social media because we enjoy um, that constant scrolling of new information, right, and getting notifications. And so um, over time, we will be making our own personal choices. The other thing we need to consider is, again, that we there's so much we don't know. And um, primarily what we are basing our knowledge about um, research-wise is coming from research uh, really about television use because we have decades and decades of research about television use and our own understanding of technology is still limited um, again because the technology keeps changing our ability to keep up with the research our understanding of its impact on individuals development and family life continues to be limited and so um, this is from um, Pickerel in an article in Time on Raising the Screen Generation. There is no reliable evidence yet of long-term risks from overexposure to screens. The current guidelines for kids' use of screen media are based on decades of research into kids' TV habits and the related outcomes, poor performance in reading, language arts, lower attention span, and higher risk of obesity among kids who watch excessively. And so, again, there is just so much that we don't know that we need to uh, continue to not only do research, but much of this comes down to individual responsibility. So. What are we to do now? Um, I have the link to Kevin Kelly's um, podcast interview on the On Being program from January of, of 28. It's a really wonderful uh, podcast. Uh, Kevin Kelly is a very much of a futurist thinker. He created Wired Magazine. He writes a lot about the impact of technology and what that means to our future lives. And um, there's one particular um, segment of that interview that I think is really, really interesting. Um, and it's about our selection of technology based on our um, thought about being in a community. And so this, again, moves us out of this individual, I use technology, I use my smartphone, I go on Facebook, I go on Twitter because I like it, right? But what is the impact and what is the benefit to us as a whole community? And will we reach a point as a community that we just go too much, right? It's no longer a benefit to us. We all use Zoom for our interactions. Maybe we will reach a point where we go, the scales are so far tipped towards it not being positive for our learning and um, our interaction as a class that we go back to using discussion boards and more asynchronous forms of communication. But it's the idea of making that choice for the well-being of a community. And again, Kevin Kelly has a very nice piece there about the Amish and making their own choice as a community about the use of technology for the well-being of their community. Um, and another one of the um, primary thinkers or early thinkers, um, she's quite young actually, <laughs> um, but Dana Boyd got out on the forefront early on. She's um, a very um, interesting, very thoughtful, deep uh, thinker and writer about technology. Um, 
and this again is from the On Being podcast, but I pull these segments out because of their relationship to our sense of family life, um, our sense of individual responsibility, because so much of our use in families and in our relationships with family members um, relates to family values and individual responsibility. And she says, I think it's a tool, meaning what is technology? It's a vice for some, it's a way of connecting, that's there's all these different layers to it. And we've had to think about how to be responsible in relationship to anything. If you think about it in terms of ancient religious texts, you think about gluttony. Think about what our relationship is to food. We agree that food is a necessity, but what's the level in which it's acceptable? Like all of these other stimuli, though, we should step back and say, hey, what is the relationship I want to have with people, with food, with substances, with the internet, with my environment? And that's where I do think that there is a spiritual ask of all of us. So in conclusion, our awareness of technology's impact and use by families begins with our careful reflection on the ways in which we use technology in our own lives, how it affects our relationships and communication, how it enhances and detracts, and what it might mean for the future. We are individuals, we're members of families and professionals or future professionals, and our intentionality on the use of technology means that we can affect change in the way that technology affects personal and family life in the future. And so with that, I welcome you again to the course. Um, it's, it will continue to be interesting, and, um, and I really invite your, your critical thoughts, um, your contemporary viewpoints, and opinions about your own technology use, um, because that's what will make the difference for our learning together as a community.